The purpose for the Rivadavia class can be traced back to the Argentine-Chilean territorial disputes over the boundary of Patagonia and control of the Beagle Channel going back to the 1840s. It nearly led to war in 1878 and kindled a naval arms race from 1887 to 1902, which was only settled the British meditation. As part of the three packs which ended the disputes, restrictions were placed on the navies of both countries. The British Royal Navy bought two Swartzhoff class dreadnought battleships that were being built for Chile, and Argentina sold its two Rivadavia class armored cruisers under construction in Italy to Japan. Meanwhile, being in the late 1880s, Brazilians Navy fell into obsolescence after an 1889 revolution, which deposed Emperor Dom Pedro II and a 1893 civil war. By the turn of the 20th century, it was lagging behind the Chilean and Argentine navies in quality and total tonnage, despite Brazil having nearly three times the population of Argentina and almost five times the population of Chile. In, eight, in 1904, however, Brazil began to seriously consider upgrading its navy to compete with Argentina and Chile. Soaring demand for coffee and rubber brought the Brazilian economy an influx of revenue, which paid for an estimated $31.25 million U.S. dollar naval repair scheme, a substantial amount for the time. The bill authorized 28 ships, including three battleships and three armored cruisers. It was not possible to lay down the battleships until 1906, the same year the trend-setting HMS Dreadnought was constructed. This ship prompted the Brazilians to cancel their battleship plans in favor of two Mayans Gruss class Dreadnoughts. The ordering of these powerful ships, designed to carry the heaviest armament in the world at the time, sharked Argentina and Chile. Historian Robert Junia comments that the dreadnoughts alone outclassed the entire elderly Argentine fleet. Debates raged in Argentina over the wisdom of the acquiring dreadnoughts to counter Brazil's. The National Automotist Party Cabinet was in favor, despite a probable cost of nearly $10 million. But a specific plan for two 14,000 long ton or 14,225 ton battleships and 10 destroyers was not popular with the public. Alarmed, the American ambassador to Brazil sent a cablegram to his Department of State, warning them of the destabilization effects that would occur if the situation devolved into a full naval arms race. Despite American entries to prelude the uh, naval arms race, Brazil continued development on the ships. This combined with renowned border disputes, particularly in the River Plate, Rio de Plata, literally Silver River area, spurred Argentina to move forward with plans for their own battleships. Inflamed by newspaper editors, opinion had swung towards supporting a naval building program, while an earlier plan called for $35 million to be invested $7 million from foreign loans. A $55 million plan was adopted in August of 1908, hoping to end the arms race. Argentina made an offer to purchase one of the two Brazilian ships, but the refusal prompted the dispatch of an Argentine naval commission to Europe in acquiring dreadnoughts. Proposals for the shipbuilders for two dreadnoughts, along with a possible third to match for Brazil, should a third ship be ordered, and 12 destroyers were solicited in 1909 by open tender.
In order to ensure that the design reflected the most modern practices, the requirements were initially vague. Fifteen shipbuilders from the United States, Great Britain, Germany, France, and Italy began bidding on the battleships. Diplomatic pressure to give the contracts was brought to bear from all of these countries, especially the first three. Even with this assistance, industry leaders in the United States believed that they had no chance in the bidding without active cooperation from their government. As Europe was the traditional arms supplier to Argentina and to all of South America, even though this was given, including the removal of imported traferns on hides from Argentina, promises for additional concessions if American shipbuilders were selected, and an offer to include the most technologically advanced fire control system and torpedo tubes available on the Argentine warships. The United States was widely viewed as a non-contender. Historian Seward W. Livermore marked that opposition to the United States was formidable. The Navy commissioned it was pro-British. The Vice President of the Republic, Requo Sanis Pena, favored Italy, where he had been the Argentine envy for many years, and the Minister of War wanted the contracts to go to Germany, so as to stabilize the military and naval equipment of the country. The President of the Newport New Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company believed that the United States would not receive contracts due to the, what he saw as a larger amount of European meddling in Argentina. He would go on to state that the political influence of foreign powers is being exerted in a very forceful manner to turn the business to English and continental firms. The King of Italy the German Emperor, and the force of English democracy were being made use of, and American firms will only have very little consideration. I fear, unless our government will exert some very powerful influence in favor of this country. The United States, however, found an ally in Buenos Aires' main daily newspaper, La Princea, the owner, editor, and naval editor, were all in favor of acquiring American designed dreadnoughts. In addition, the paper found evidence of British wrongdoing in a related naval contract. Under public pressure, the Naval Commission was forced to reconsider its original list, which had faced the Italy, or which had placed Italy first and Britain second. It now featured the United States first, Britain second, and Italy last. In a surprise move, the Argentine Navy Commission then threw out all of the ongoing tenders and called for another round of bidding. They simultaneously updated the specifications to include what they were judging to be the best aspects for all plans. The competitors were given three weeks to complete and come up with new designs and net cost estimates. After po po diplomatic protest, this was modified slightly. The original bids were kept, but alterations to attempt to conform the new desired characteristics were allowed. The commission found that the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company bid was lowest on one battleship, and the Four River Shipbuilding Company was lowest on the other. Despite the British attempt to allow the Armstrong, Whitworth, and Vickers team to lower their price by $570,000, prompt American democracy granted being various accessories or sources regarding recent events between the United States and Brazil and the upcoming 1910 Pan-American Conference.
as well as a guarantee of American participation participation in the Argentine continental celebrations secured the battleship contracts for Four River on the 21st of January 1910. The maximum price Four River tendered was 10.7 million. Under bid, the British should buy more than $9,730,000, but the ship's displacement was 2,000 long tons smaller. The armor belt was 2 inches or 51 millimeters thinner, and the top speed was slightly slower. Orders for the 12 destroyers were divided among Britain, France, and Germany. Rivadavia was built by Four River at its shipyard in Massachusetts, but they were constructively obligated to subcontract the second ship to a different shipyard in the hope that both would be completed faster, so Monroe was constructed by the ship or the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden, New Jersey. The steel for the ship were largely supplied by the Bretham Steel Company in Pennsylvania, which, due to their ability to produce steel at a lower price than other nations, was an integral cost-saving measure. The Secretary of the Argentine Naval Commission, the body which chose the final design, said that the reason the American tender was lower than that of the English was that steel for construction work and armor plating is a greater deal cheaper in the United States than England. Wages are higher there, but the contractors were able to obtain it more cheaply owing to the manipulations of the Steel Trust. A third dreadnought provided for the contract was strongly supported by Argentine and the United States diplomats during 1910, while the Minas Greece class was still under construction. La Presia and one of its rivals, La Argentina, heavily advocated a third ship. The later even started a pendant to raise money for a new battleship. An American diplomat wrote back to the United States that this newspaper reverently promises the early conclusion of a m movement which means a third battleship, whether it be public subscription or by government funds. However, Brazil's 21-26th of November Revolt of the Lash, in which the three most powerful ships in the fleet, the battleship set Mina Gracis and Sao Paulo, and the cruiser Bahia and several smaller warships violated, rebelled, crushing the previous settlement for a new battleship. After two years later, in October of 1912, a third dreadnought was authorized by Argentina to chase Brazil's Rio de Janeiro was completed and delivered. The ship was never named or built, as Rio de Janeiro was sold to the Ottoman Empire due to money issues, and a later planned Brazilian ship, of which a name I cannot pronounce, was cancelled due to the beginning of the First World War. The choice of Four River came as a complete surprise to the European builders. Britain's reaction in particular was scathing. Sir John H. Biles, a professor and well-known naval architect, decries the bidding process as unethical, later saying it may be presumed that everything good in the first proposals was seized upon by the Argentine authorities and asked for in the new design. This second request, not only to British builders, but to all the builders of the world, and in this way, it is excitingly pro probable that a series of oh, leakage of ideas and practice of our own ships were determined through the world by the Argentine government. The third inquiry that was issued showed to all the builders of the world that it was only 
and has been eliminated or modified in the second inquiry. And so, the process of leakage went merely on, and with it, that of the education of foreign builders and the Argentine government. Various British newspapers, newspapers also cried foul. The Evening Standard believed that as Argentina's greater contender and greatest client, Britain ought to have been awarded the two ships. The Times took a different track, accusing American shipbuilders of sloshing prices to an obscene degree, and accusing the government of exerting undue diplomatic pressure to obtain the contracts. New Zealand's Evening Port noted that the United States had previously built ten major warships for other countries, including Russia and Britain's ally Japan, and commented, the severity of the blow to England rests in, and the amount of English capital in Argentina, possibly echoing the Evening Standard's argument. They referred to a startling fact printed by the Daily Mail. The steel used for the armor of the American design was obtained for a much lower price, with Betham's ability to produce it at eight um Yen, less per ton than British foundries. A cost saving of more than 10% in steel over the British ship could be realized. Germany asserted that the United States was given the opportunity to view the other nations' tenders and lower their pricing accordingly. Germany also alleged that the United States had secured the deal by pledging to come to Argentina's defense should they become embroiled in a military conflict. The, Un the New York Times noted that with Argentina's and Brazil's dreadnought orders, countries in North and South America were building the five biggest capital ships in the world. Brazil's Rio de Janeiro, Argentina's Rivadavia, and Monaro. In the United States, New York class of the USS New York and USS Texas. In addition to seven of the ten largest, including the United States, so Wyoming, and Arkansas, or Arkansas, shortly after Rivadavia had completed its trials, the United States Navy's Board of Inspect and Survey remarked that the ships handled remarkably well. With comparative minor modifications, the vessel would particularly meet the requirements of our own vessels. The Board of Inspection was less pleased with the winged turrets, stating that while theoretically the, Re uh, the Riva Divia has an, uh, an head and a stern fire of six guns, this is not so in reality, as it's almost certain that the blast from the waist turrets would dish in the smoke pipes and damage the uptakes. After Brazil sold Rio de Janeiro to the Ottoman Empire, Argentina began to actively seek buyer for their two ships so that profits could be invested in education. In the tension that preceded the First World War, there were many suitors. The United States, however, abhorred the idea of their latest technological advances falling into the hands of a pop possible future combat opponent. While the contract allowed the United States Navy an option to acquire the ships if a deal was reached with a third nation, the Navy did not want the ships. With the rapid advance in dreadnought technology, such as the all-or-nothing armor arrangement, even new ships like Rivadavia and Marino were seen as outmoded. Three bills directing it that the battleships be sold were introduced into the Argentine Naval Congress, or Argentine National Congress, in the summer of 1914, but to all were defeated. Soon, soon, still, after the beginning of the First World War, the German ambassador to Argentina alleged to the United States Department that 
Britain's Royal Navy was going to take over the ships as soon as the ships reached the River Plate. And the British put diplomatic pressure on the United States to try and ensure the ships were not sold to any other country, as this new country could in turn sell them to Germany. Italy, the Ottomans, and Greece were all reportedly interested in buying both ships. The later as a counter to the Ottoman purchase of Rio de Janeiro. The United States read that its neutrality would not be respected and its technology would be reused for study to a foreign competitor. But diplomatic pressure on Argentina to keep the ships, which it eventually did. Unlike other ships of the time, such as the Gigros Averoff that the Italian Navy had built and sold to the um, Greek Navy earlier in the century. The Rivadavia design was very similar to a 1906 proposal from a Four River for an American dreadnought class. This ship would have mounted a main battery of 14 12 inch 300mm guns and twin turrets, two super firing, four two wing, and three non super firing aft. A secondary battery of 24 inch or 102mm guns and four torpedo tubes on a hull of 22,000 long tons. That would be capable of 21 knots. Foreign practices also bore a large influence on the design. Most were acquired through the unique design process of rejecting multiple bids and calling for the best aspects of each. For example, the super firing arrangement of the main battery was an American innovation, while the wing turrets were similar to British designs at the time. The secondary battery of 6-inch, 152mm guns, and the three-shaft system were influenced by German design practices, while the engine and boiler room layout was reminiscent of the Italian battleship Dante Alighieri. Unlike and possibly following the exact same route that Italy and Greece tried to take with their cruiser or armored cruiser, the Gagros Averoff. Although, although an amazing ship, it would turn into a complete engineering nightmare. The two ships of the Riva Davia class were 594 feet and 9 inches or 181.28 meters overall and 585 feet or 178 meters between perpendiculars. They had a beam of 98 feet, 4.5 inches, and a normal draft of 27 feet, 8.5 inches, and that have and also had a displacement fully loaded at 30,100 long tons at full load. The ship's staffed by 130 officers and about 1,000 enlisted men. For armament, the Riviadelphia class was equipped with a main battery of 12 12-inch 12 50 caliber guns, a secondary battery of 12 5-inch 152mm or 50-50 caliber guns, and 12 4-inch 102mm 50 QNF, and 2 21-inch 533mm torpedo tubes. The 12-inch 50 caliber guns was a Behelman design. It was most likely based on the weapon used in the United States Wyoming class battleships. The 12-inch 50 caliber Mark 7 gun. The 12 guns were mounted in six twin turrets. Four turrets were super firing fore and aft, while the other two were located and along the sides of the ships in wing turrets. The latter weapons could, in theory, fire on a 180 degree range on their respective sides of the hull, and 100 degrees on the other. But in reality, this was not possible, as the blast damage from the weapons would damage the ship. A more reasonable estimate to it would be 90 degrees on their sides. The 6-inch second armament was placed in casemates, with six guns on each side of the ship. 
for protection. They were provided with 6 inches of armor, the 4 inch ar weaponry, intended for use against set marting destroyers, were mounted unarmored in various places around the ship, including the main deck superstructure and far up and near the bow. As originally built, they were 16 4-inch guns, but four of those were replaced with 3-inch AA guns and four 3-pounder during the 1924 through 1926 modernization. The torpedo tubes were located underneath the waterline and were located in a decayed compartment. Full ammunition loads were 1,444 rounds for the 12-inch guns, 120 per gun. 3,600 rounds for the 6-inch, or 300 rounds for each gun, and 5,600 rounds for the 4-inch, or 350 gun or rounds per gun, and 16 torpedoes manufactured by Whitehead. To assist the main battery with targeting during the battle, the two ships were equipped with two Bar and Stroud Raider range finders that were located above the Koning Towers. Rivadavia and Monorail used Brown Curtis geared steam turbines powered by 18 Babcock and Wilcox boilers and connected to three compellers, or were connected to three propeller shafts, with a total output of about 40,000 shaft horsepower. The ships were designed to travel at a maximum speed of 22.5 knots, and may have been capable of slightly more, at speeds of 11 to 15 knots. Their endurance range from 11,000 to 700 nautical miles, respectively. Their fuel was a coal slash oil mix, and their ships carried 3,900 long tons of the former and 590 long tons of the later. Typical of American designed dreadnoughts at the time, the Rivia Davia class included substantial armor protection, a 12 inch 305 mm belt was fitted amidships, covering 5 feet or 1.5 mm above and 6 feet or 1.8 meters below the water design waterline. Gradually decreasing towards the bow and stern to 5 inches or 127 millimeters and 4 inches 100 millimeters, respectively. The gun turrets received heavy armor, including 12 inch or 305 millimeters uh, thickness on the front, 9 inches or 230 millimeters on the sides, 9.5 inches or 240 millimeters on the back and 4 inches or 100 millimeters on the top. Deck armor consisted of 0.5 inches or 13 millimeter medium steel and 2 inch 51 millimeter nickel steel. After the two dreadnoughts were awarded to Four River, Monroe was subcontracted out to the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden, New Jersey, as called for in the final contract. Monroe's keel was laid down on the 9th of July, 1910, and the construction was overseen by the Argentine Naval Commission. With the completion of the hull, it was launched on the 23rd of September, 1911. Isabel Bethfor, wife to the chief of the Argentine Naval Commission, sponsored Monroe. The ship was then moored to a dock to commence fitting out. It was reported in July of 1913 that, apart from the usual naval requirements for Monroe and her sister ship A.R.A. Rivadavia, two victorial photographs apiece were included as part of the official specifications. Monroe was finished on the 15th of February 1915 and commissioned into the Argentine Navy nine days later. Over the course of their construction, Rivadavia and Monroe were the subject of various rumors insulating that Argentina would accept the ships and then sell them to a European country, or Japan, a fast-growing rival to the United States. The rumors were partially true. Argentina was looking to get rid of the battleships and devote 
the proceeds to opening more schools. This angered the American government, which did not want its worship technology offered to the highest bidder. Yet they did not want to exercise a contract specific option that gave the United States first choice if the Argentinas decided to sell. As this new technology had already been progressed that passed the Rivadavias, particularly in the adoption of the All or Nothing Armor Scheme. Instead, the United States and its State Department and Navy Department put diplomatic pressure on the Argentine government. The Argentine government, bolstered by solicitic additions in the legislature, introduced several bills in May of 1914, which would have put the battleships up for sale. But the bills were all defeated by late June. Following the commencement of the First World War, the German and British investors to the United States both complained to the United States State Department. The former believed that the British were going to be given the ships as soon as they reached Argentina, and the later charged the United States with ensuring that the ships fell into Argentine's position only. International armament companies attempted to influence Argentina into selling them to one of the smaller Balkan countries from which they would find their way into war. In October 1914, Monroe sailed the New York Naval Shipyard to be painted, then conducted its sea trials starting on the 25th. Reporters for several newspapers, including the New York Times and American naval officers, were allowed on board during this time. The Times reporters gave a going account of the alcohol-serving cave on the ship, calling it the cutest little bar on any of the seven seas. Alcohol was banned on United States warships. The Trials were plagued with serious engine troubles, tumulting in the favor of an entire turbine on the 2nd of November. Monroe was forced to put into the Rockland, Maine, where many of the overseers on board were left to be brought back by train to Camden, before proceeding for repairs to the Four River Shipyard, which had built the ship's engines. In early 1915, nearly five years after construction had begun, the shipbuilding contractors demanded payment for the Argentine government for an additional work. But the Argentines did not believe that, that this was warranted, as Monroe had been scheduled to be completed more than a year prior. After meditation offered by Franklin D. Roosevelt, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy at the time, Monroe was released on the 20th of February to Argentine sailors who had been staying in American battleships, mourned in the Philadelphia Naval Yard. Even Monroe's departure was marked by mishaps. On the night of the 26th of March, Monroe accidentally rammed and sank the barge Enterprise in the Delaware River. 30 miles or 43 kilometers south of Philadelphia, near the city of Newcastle. No one was hurt, but the battleship accidentally ran aground immediately after. Efforts to refloat it were succeeded, and Monroe continued on its way on at around 7.30 the next morning, without damage. On the 29th, the president um, at the time of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, was hosted for lunch on board the warship, accompanied by the Argentine ambassador to the United States. Romano S. Nolan. On the 15th of April, Monroe ran aground again in the river this time, this time near Reddy Island. Like the previous time, the ship was not damaged and tugs were able to refloat the ship the next day. Monroe was finally able to dock in Argentina for the first time on the 26th of May, 1915. The ship was immediately assigned to the Argentine Navy's First Division, based out of the major naval base of Porter Bonginato. It remained there until 1923, when it was put into the reserve fleet. 
1924, Monroe was sent to the United States for modernization, the opportunity to show what the flag was not mess. Monroe made stops in Vesperos and Colorado before transiting the Panama Canal and sailing north. Most of the work was done in Philadelphia, though. Armament changes were made in Boston. Monroe was converted to use fuel oil instead of coal. Was fitted with a new fire control system. Ring finders were added to the fore and aft super firing turrets, and the aft mast was replaced by a tripod to reduce exhaust interference when spotting ships in a battle. A funnel cap was installed. The main armaments range was increased from 13,120 yards or 1,200 meters to 20,800 yards or 19,000 meters, and the turrets were modified to double the firing rate. The 6-inch secondary armament was retained, but the smaller 4-inch guns were taken off in favor of four 3-inch 700 or, excuse me, 79 mil or 76 millimeter anti-aircraft guns and four three-pound guns. When Monorome returned to Argentina in August 1926, it was initially assigned to the training division in the Navy, before being reassigned to the 1st Division. In 1932, Monorome was moved into a new battleship division with Rivadavia. The remainder of the 1930s was fitted with diplomatic cruises. Monorome, escorted by the three Mendoza cluster shores, brought Argentine President Austin Pedro Jostal to Brazil in 1933 for a major diplomatic visit. Departing in the afternoon of the 2nd of October, he arrived in Rio de Janeiro on the morning of the 7th of October to huge celebrations. Brazilian ships of the 1st and 2nd squadrons, along with three squadrons worth of warplanes, met Monaro at sea and escorted it to the harbor. When Justo landed and traveled by car to the Gandra Palace, or Gonbra Palace, the road was flanked by a plethora of army and naval forces, along with thousands of citizens. Rio was described as a blaze with light and a 95 foot or 29 meter high imitation of Francis Arched de Comfy was erected onto which various colors were projected. Justo then took a royal train, originally designed for Albert I of Belgium's Eastern Brazil's 1922 sentimental celebration to Sao Paulo. After three days, he traveled to Santos, where he boarded Monroe again to travel first to Uruguay, then back to Argentina. He arrived in the Raider on the 22nd of October. In 1934, Monero was set to, as one of Argentine's respectives for the anniversary of Brazil's independence. In 1937, Rivadavia and Monero were sent on a diplomatic cruise to Europe, departing Argentina on the 6th of April. They split up when they reached the English Channel. Monero participated in the British Split Head Naval Review, where the New York Times described it as a strange, versatile sea monster in this company of more modern fighting ships. Afterward, Monero met up with Rivadavia at Brest, France, and cruised together to Wilmshaven before splitting up again. Monero went to Berman, while Rivadavia put in at Hamburg. They then sailed for home and arrived in Puerto Madagal on the 29th of June. In December of 1939, Monero and Rivadavia traveled together to Brazil with naval cadets. However, before they could return for Bruno Aries across the shores and to be sent to escort the ships back as the Second World War had erupted in Europe, since Argentina remained neutral in the war, Monero saw little active service. By 1949, the vulnerable dreadnought had been decommissioned into reserve and was used as a 
as a barracks ship. In 1955, Monorail was used as a prison ship during the Liberating Revolution. The ship was stricken from the naval list on the 1st of October 1956. On the 11th of January 1957, Argentina sold Monero for scrap for two million four hundred and sixty-eight thousand and six hundred and sixty dollars to the Japanese Yawata Iron and Steel Company. On the 12th of May, the Argentine fleet assembled to salute the battleship one last time as it was towed out to by the Dutch-owned ocean tugs, Seedent and Ocean. Monorail was taken through the Panama Canal to the Scrappers, arriving on the 16th of August. Although weird ships, in a sense, especially because of their overall design and turret layout, and, of course, using multiple different concepts from other nations, it holds a wonder on why um, these ships came to be, and I don't exactly have an answer for that. In all honesty, these ships, through my research, especially after finding them, and believe me, it was a complete mistake whenever I found these ships, because it was actually a miss Google search that I had mistaken, and these looked almost identical to the Asian court at first look. Believe it or not, come to find out, they weren't the Asian court. So, doing more research throughout it, and I found out that these were, in fact, Argentina. Um, born ships that came from the United States. So, moving on from that and all that blunder, overall, these ships, although not exactly much for history in a sense, do play a significant role, especially in the, I guess, the peacetime of Argentina. Yes, Argentina gets a bad reputation, especially after World War II, but it does still hold a massive aspect of history, especially with this being one of the very few ships that um, the United States actually built and gave to another nation. Very few ships can actually hold that title, and most of which are just destroyers, cruisers, or some other type of warship. Never, never a battleship, or even a ship of a scale has ever been done like this until these ships. So, I guess, with that being said, I hope you guys did enjoy it. I hope you guys did learn something about these ships, because I know I did, through my research. So, with that being said, um, I hope you all enjoyed. I hope you guys learned something, again. So, please go hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and leave a comment down below, and... If you have any questions, concerns, or anything like that, make sure you guys leave them down there. Make sure you hit the like button if you did enjoy it. And with that being said, I again hope everybody enjoyed it, and I will see you all in the next video. Peace out.